okay? Because as Steve mentioned, we're trying to open a new frontier in astronomy. Uh, we've been talking about doing astronomy from the surface of the moon for a long, long time, as I would mention. And this is happening now. What can we do, what we have now on the moon, to make progress? So this is essentially what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk not only about the moon, but I want to talk in particular about galaxies. Something that we've known for about 100 years now is the universe is enormous. It's filled with about 100 billion galaxies. And it's interesting because one way we've discovered that is to be able to measure their distance. And the basic number to be able to measure the distance of a galaxy is you have to know first the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And this is why they're studying the transit of Venus in particular 100 years ago in Hawaii was so important. Everything, all what we call the distance ladder in astronomy is based on that number. Okay, so this is why it was such a big deal. Okay, so we've known that the universe is full of galaxies and when you start looking at them, it's very complicated. Okay, they all look most of the time different. Some are blue, some are red, some are big, some are, they look like big blobs, some are this, some are beautiful, some look like nothing. Nothing interesting at all. So one of the main challenges of astrophysics these days is to understand the origin of these differences. Okay. So we have a ton of questions. I'm not going to, tr to grow through that. But understanding the origin of galaxy or they evolve, including our own, is one of the main topics of modern astrophysics. To do this, astronomers are using all kinds of tools, different tools. Some are the telescope that you might know. Some that you see at Costco, for example, can be used to look at galaxies, okay? Astronomers have used big telescopes, one of them, the CFHT on Mauna Kea here that you can see. Use a lot of time on CFHT is used to observe galaxies. But we also observe galaxies with things like the Hubble Space Telescope, which has revolutionized the field completely. Maybe less familiar to you, we also listen to galaxies. We do radio uh, astronomy. Uh, we listen to radio wave coming out of these objects. And one thing that we've known for quite some time now, if you want to observe galaxies, you need a good site. You need a good place to do this. Because galaxies are faint objects, some are extremely far away. Okay? So it's very difficult. If you want to observe galaxies in the universe, at the edge of the universe, you cannot do that in the middle of a town with the light and stuff like that, okay? So, there's essentially three main criteria when you decide to find a site to observe a galaxy. One, it has to be very dark. The background, the emission from the atmosphere or the light around you has to be very small, okay? Very dark site. The other one is, it would be very nice if you can observe other things than the visible light, okay? And this little plot that you see here, okay, all you see in the visible light with your eyes are this little band that you see. But these curves that you see show that light coming from galaxies is also found outside of these bands. If you want to observe galaxies, for example, you need to observe in the infrared, you need to observe in the ultraviolet, you need to observe in the radio, uh, radio wave, and some of this energy is much larger than the visible band. So a site or a place where you can observe more than the visible is also important. And the third one that is rarely mentioned, but it is important, observing an object for a long period of time is, an, is important. You just don't want to take a snapshot and leave it alone. Why do you want to do this? We've known now for many years that most galaxies have a black hole in their center. You cannot see the black hole, but the black hole can be millions of masses of, so, uh, uh, of equivalent of the sun. And these things sometimes get very hungry, okay? So they can shred apart if the star or planet or an object goes too close to it. It will just shred it apart. And when this happens, you can see, for example, this object that's being destroyed will be seen in a certain light, for example, in the ultraviolet, for example. We've known now by observing some of these objects that from time to time the center of these objects are becoming more luminous. That means that the black hole is eating something. 
Okay? We've seen that in our own galaxy, but we still don't know very well how it works, how often this happens, because we just don't observe galaxies for a long time like this very often. We just don't have a good site to do this. So we need a site that's very dark. We need a site that will allow to observe different wavelengths, different light, okay? And a site, stable site, that you can put the telescope and look at an object and just look what it's doing <coughs> over a long period of time. There are three solutions for that. One is High Mountain. Mauna Kea, for example, is the darkest site on the surface of the Earth. This is the best site to observe galaxies. No doubt about that. A large fraction of time used by telescopes is uh, by telescope on Mauna Kea to observe galaxies. The other one is to send a telescope in space. We've done that many times, okay? It works very well, it's very pricey, there's no doubt about that. And these missions, most of the time, do not last very long. Uh, we are building right now a big telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope that's been now being built for more than 10 years, cost $10 billion, and might be operated maybe no more than like for 10 years or something like that. Many galaxies will be discovered with that target, okay, that, that telescope, but there's more to that. And another site that's possible, maybe, is the surface of the moon. Astronomy from the surface of the moon has been a subject, a topic in science fiction for a long, long time. If you read old books, 30s, 40s, uh, having a telescope, people living on, on, on the surface of the moon, having a telescope to observe the universe, is not a new concept at all. Okay? And science fiction has been really popular. It became reality, as it's been mentioned already a few times, with Apollo 16 in 1972, when these three guys, John Young, uh, Charles Duke, and Ken McKinley, went and not only carried a car, okay, to move around the moon, but for the first time, they had a telescope, okay? Somebody had the genius idea after reading science fiction books, let's bring a telescope, because somebody could be very useful. So this telescope is very ingenious, actually. It was used to observe in the ultraviolet, by, uh, designed by a guy known George Carruthers, a genius, an American genius, uh, who invented many, many designs in astronomy and, and physics in general. And this telescope is seen here to be prepared in the laboratory by uh, John Young. And they brought it to the moon and put it next to the lander and observed. Okay, the telescope, by the way, is still there. Okay, they did not bring it back. And the way it works was with film. People, some of the oldest one might remember a film, real film, okay? I, I give this talk to young, oh, some of the young students, they have no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, what's that? Well, they moved the telescope by and, and they had a film, and when they were done, they put it in their pocket and brought it down to work, and they went to Walmart or whatever and get a diploma, okay? So, and they observe stars, they took 178 pictures, but one of the objects they observed was not a star, okay? This is the plane of the Milky Way, and if you look here, there's an object. This is called the Large Magellanic Cloud. This is, in fact, a galaxy satellite next to our own galaxy. And why they choose to observe that object is if you see all these blue and red blobs there, this is because these are new stars that are being formed. These stars are very hot. Hot stars in it and the ultraviolet. So they had an ultraviolet telescope, so let's observe a galaxy which has a lot of these star forming regions. This is the image they got. The resolution was terrible, okay? By the standard, it was essentially taking a picture, but they got the image on the right, show you the galaxy, and on the left, you see all these blobs are really the star formation in, these, uh, in this object seen by, from the moon. They published many papers. This is fascinating to read these papers, by the way, 1972, 1973. But that was really the first astronomy on the moon, okay? Now, you can imagine that after the Apollo mission, we would go back to the moon all the time, do astronomy, walk on it, build a base, blah, blah, blah. But we all know that it did not happen, okay? So what next? We had to wait 42 years for the Chinese Space Agency to have the bright idea to 
start developing a project, a program to start exploring the moon again. And somebody had the idea, oh, wait a minute, maybe we should send a telescope again on the moon. Okay. So they built the lander, uh, the lander here that you see inside there, the other little rover that was called the rabbit. Okay. But if you look in more details, you see on the left, Okay, you see this thing that's up there? This is the cover of an instrument that's inside the lander. And inside that cover, there's this telescope. This is a little six inch telescope, also built for ultraviolet light, because the moon has no atmosphere, so you can see <coughs> ultraviolet light very easily, okay? And this is a marvel of it's very genius. This thing is a complete robotic telescope. They program it two weeks in advance before they do the observing. And this thing is quite intelligent, actually. This is the only instrument still working in the mission right now. They're very proud of that. <laughs> okay? They were very, very happy to tell me that many times in the last uh, two months ago when I was in China. Okay? But this is really the first robotic telescope that's on the moon. There's one disadvantage that you have to forget everything I told you about the dark side, sight, okay? The telescope has to be operated during daytime because they need the power from the sun to power the lander, okay? So try to observe stars and galaxies during daytime, even on the moon, is not easy. So this is also for ultraviolet, okay? So I will skip that. But there's this guy here who's been dreaming about the telescope on the moon for several decades now. And he started to talk to the Chinese and went out through CFHT and through different circumstances. Uh, the question ended up in my email box. Pierre, if you had time on a small telescope on the moon, what would you do with it? And I said, I would observe a galaxy because I work on galaxies. I would care about stars, even if I'm teaching star start class right now. Okay, don't tell that to my students, okay? <laughs> so I wrote a proposal to the Chinese space uh, agency. They were very skeptical because they knew that by observing during the daytime on the moon, it's very difficult to see this faint object. So I selected four objects that are very bright, a lot of star formations, or very blue, and I say, maybe they will be visible. I had no idea if it was possible or not. I sent that. They have an amazing amount of software to plan the observations because the motion of the moon is very different from the Earth. So <coughs> it's quite complex how to calculate if an object is visible. You cannot move the telescope. There's a mirror in front of the telescope that selects object. The telescope cannot stir like this. Okay? So, and by Incredible chance one of the objects that I sent was visible for a certain period of time. Okay, this is this galaxy M101, which is, as you can see, this is one of the biggest galaxies we know, 21 million light years away. Okay, and all these little blobs that you see were star formation. So it seems to be best possible. They told me you have two windows, they give us 10 hours to try. Can we do this or not? That was the only thing we wanted to, can we do this or not, okay? So, they tried in November 2014, okay? They tried for two hours, and I got an email in the morning saying, Pierre, look at this. So I said, oh man, okay? And I got that. <laughs> you have to have a lot of imagination to see galaxy in there, okay? <laughs> Nothing, okay? Why? It's because to do this, they discovered that you have to wait when the, the sun is very low on the horizon, so the beginning of the lunar day, okay? Because of some technical difficulties, they could not start the observations uh, at, the, at the time plan, okay? So all this light that you see there is all light coming from the sun reflecting in the telescope uh, everywhere, okay? So the background is just too high, you cannot see the galaxy. So, uh, but we got another window. So the promise was, we really want to try. These guys were amazing, okay? And in December, wake up in the morning, another email, and this time, uploading it, and you see that object. 
okay? Beautiful, okay? This day was a good day for Steve and myself. It was pretty amazing. This is the first galaxy ever observed from another world, okay? Uh, after the Large Magellanic Club, the first large galaxy, okay? So, this one over the press, it's still going on all over the internet, uh, even months later. What can we do? This is a comparison. This is a bit hard to see on the screen. On the left, you see the object. On the right, this compared to the normal object. Now, we prove we can do that, okay? What kind of science can we do with this, okay? So I started to analyze things. The analysis is still <coughs> going on. We detected 44 of these star-forming regions in the galaxy. Okay, the resolution is poor because it's a small telescope that was very difficult to see. But we can see it's a galaxy, okay, we see it. From there you can analyze all kinds of things, how many stars are formed, blah, 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 you know, the astrophysics, you know. Will, in astronomy, you get a picture, this is nice, the Romans is perfect, and it lasts five minutes, and after that you have to do science and publish something. Okay, so this is what we try to do. Okay, what, what, can, what can we do? And in fact, you can compare with data already existing on that object. And you can do some science with even this 30 minutes exposure taken from the moon. Okay? So, uh, so this is work in progress. We don't know if we will do it again with that telescope because the lim it's very limited because it cannot move. Okay? But clearly, I think astronomy, even extragalactic astronomy from the moon, it's possible now, okay? It's happening, okay? So some might be asked, what's the next step? Well, as you've seen, there are smaller tele small telescopes planned to be on the moon's surface in a few years. Christian is building it, okay? It's going to work, made in Canada, so it's going to work perfectly, <laughs> okay? So, and these telescopes will be used to do real astronomy, okay? Observing all the time. Uh, by the way, the LUT, the small telescope for the Chinese lander, has been used mostly to study a bunch of stars that we call variable stars, okay? And they have published now very, very nice results from that. Um, very nice, okay? And after that, what do we do? Can we imagine better, a bigger telescope on the surface of the moon? Then you have to look at the cost, for example, how to, what it costs to maintain it, to build it, all of these things. But people have now designs for to be very large telescopes, very different nature, okay? Uh, who knows, okay? Before somebody asked me, can you build TMT on the moon? The answer right now is certainly not for at least another 100 years, okay? Because of the cost, you will have to build it there, probably. So you have to live on the moon for years before we can do this, okay? So, but this is the first step. Okay, we have an observatory on the moon. This is when I went to China two months ago to meet the team, which is very funny because this is the PI is in the center, Jiwan uh, Wei, <laughs> and he told me that his name translated in English to John Young. <laughs> John Young. John Young was the commander of Apollo 16, and John Young is the commander of the small person. Okay, so. Thank you very much. Uh, this was fun now we continue to do it. Thank you.